Since prehistoric times, crystals have fascinated mankind. They have been appreciated for their transparent beauty, admired as jewelry, revered as instruments of healing. They have unique properties that make their use instrumental in modern technology like electronics. Diamonds, for example, are used in the tips of massive drills, but also as a sacred symbol of partnership. Another interesting example of a crystal, which may have had both a practical as well as a sacred function, was quartz used in ancient spears. Recently, a remarkable set of crystal weapons found inside the massive megalithic tombs of southwestern Spain by archaeologists that include crystal arrowheads, an exquisite dagger blade, and cores used for creating the artifacts all dating back to at least the 3rd millennium BC. Numerous ivory objects were also discovered buried with bodies, and red pigment made from cinnabar was sprayed over the body and artifacts. Most, if not all, were found, I believe, in the fetal position. The exact location where they were found was excavated between 2007 and 2010, extending for over 44 meters in total, that's about 144 feet, and was constructed out of large slabs of slate. And at least 25 individuals were interred within the structure, along with an extraordinary set of grave goods, most notable of which is an unspecified number of shrouds or clothes decorated with tens of thousands of amber beads. Additionally, a large number of beautiful crystal arrowheads were found together which may be suggestive of a ritual like an offering at an altar. The transparent arrowheads have the characteristic long lateral appendices of flint arrowheads from the area but investigators remark that and I quote even greater skill must have been required to produce these unique features when using rock crystal, end quote. Making spear tips is a lot harder than it looks. It's very dangerous, especially with obsidian, which is so sharp they used it to shave with. And it's very easy to make a mistake and have to start over from scratch. It shatters easy. And so the production is likely even more difficult to do using crystals as a medium. This is distinct technology. It isn't something that all cultures just instinctively did. Tool creation like this is a specialized skill. It's based on an accumulation of transmitted empirical knowledge and experience. So it's been used by anthropologists along with genetics, linguistics, and other archeology span to help postulate the dating and method of the peopling of the Americas. Now looking at these crystal spears from Spain and comparing them to some stone artifacts, we can see that they're what we call Solutrean, a tool making style from around 22,000 to 17,000 years ago. Now the Clovis culture is a prehistoric Paleo-Indian culture named for distinct stone tools found near Clovis, New Mexico that are dated to around 13,000 years ago. And they look like this compared to Solutrean. You can see the area of the Clovis that has an area carved away that is called a flute, so it could hold the pole better, the split stick in the center. Here you can see how it would have been attached. This is the main difference between it and Solutrean, found in Western Europe 17,000 years ago. Both are bifacial, meaning blades on both sides. Clovis is the name given to everything found in a new world dated to the end of the Pleistocene, around 13,000 years ago, including Mexico, for example. So there's a gap of about 4,000 years that is used by traditional anthropologists to deny a link to Europe, insisting the Bering Strait or Siberian land route was the point of arrival for the Clovis hunters. Given the technical skill and difficulties involved in creating the objects from crystal rather than flint, researchers believed, and I quote, 
The more technically sophisticated items, however, were deposited in the larger megalithic structures. As such, it is reasonable to assume that although the raw material was relatively available throughout the community, only the kin groups, factions, or individuals who were buried in the megaliths were able to afford the added value that allowed the production of sophisticated objects such as arrowheads or dagger blades." End quote. It seems, therefore, reasonable to suggest that raw crystals may have had dual significance. It had a social significance due to the exoticism of the material and the fact that its transformation required very specific skills. The article goes on to say, and I quote, Interestingly, though, despite being found relatively frequently in burials of the 4th and 3rd millennium BC, crystal implements disappear from later funerary monuments in the early Bronze Age, which is the beginning of the 2nd millennium BC, and a truly striking development, researchers say. As it would seem, the use of this raw material as grave goods was almost entirely abandoned, although the reason remains a mystery." End quote. Now, Archaeologists Dennis Sanford and Bruce Bradley suggest that the Clovis Point of the Americas derived from the points of Solutrean culture of southern France around 19,000 years ago through the Cactus Hill Points of Virginia, which is dated to about 16,000 years ago. The first genetic analysis on living Native American tribes shows that they were made of four distinct mtDNA haplogroups called A, B, C, and D, Group B, they assert, probably came to America from the South Pacific or Japan via boats. Then in 1997, a fifth mtDNA haplogroup was identified in Native Americans, and this group called X, haplogroup X, is present in 3% of living Native Americans. Haplogroup X was not then found in Asia, but found only in Europeans and some in the Middle East. Archaeologists and geneticists are certain that the presence of X in America is not the result of the historic intermarriages with Europeans who arrived with Columbus or even the Vikings, predating both and now having also been detected in the ancient remains of Basque graves. The X haplogroup appears to have entered America in limited numbers perhaps as long as 34,000 years ago, then again around 12,000 to 10,000 BC the time of the Clovis invasions or arrivals. The B haplogroup found only in Aboriginal groups in Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Melanesia, Polynesia, may represent the people of the mythological Mu. Both Chinese and Japanese archeologists take the idea of melting glaciers from the ice age, submerging a landmass in the Pacific seriously. And the B haplogroup findings closely match the myth and legends recalled about the continent from which survivors allegedly escaped the destruction around 50,000 years ago, escaping to places like China, India, Japan, and sources that mention Atlantis, from Plato to Edgar Cayce, indicated that the largest migration from Atlantis occurred just before 10,000 BC, and many of these Atlantean survivors seeking refuge from the northeastern coast areas of America and Canada, some becoming, for example, the Iroquois. When we take sea level rise over the last 20,000 years, which is the time frame attributed to the Solutrean, or people who use Solutrean lithic tool technology, lithic just means stone, then we see that much of the eastern US has been submerged and much of the archaeology from those possible earlier settlements with it. These were seafaring people, the mythical Atlanteans, if they existed. And if they didn't, then the Basque sure were seafaring people, would probably have preferred to live along the coast, the eastern coast, as the Basque mostly populate Western Europe with access to the sea. It is of little surprise then that a remarkable series of several dozen European style stone tools dating back between 19,000 and 26,000 years have been discovered at six locations along the U.S. East Coast. They were discovered by a scallop dredging fisherman on the seabed 60 miles from the Virginian coast on what in prehistoric times would have been dry land. So the new discoveries are among the most important archaeological breakthroughs for several decades and they're set to add substantially to our understanding 
of humanity spread around the globe, especially since these newly discovered and recently dated stone tools are therefore contemporary with the virtually identical Western European material. What's more, chemical analysis carried out recently on a European style stone knife found in Virginia back in 1971 revealed that it was made of French originating flint. Of course, when considering the facts that there were more Clovis points found in a small segment of the East Coast than there was in all the sites west of the Mississippi combined, and you can include Asia too if you'd like, then the idea that the U.S. was populated from the East with genetic affinities to modern Europeans becomes rather plausible and that the true origins of the Clovis culture, as well as the 9,000-year-old Caucasian-looking mummies of the Florida bogs or the 9,000-year-old Caucasian-looking spirit cave mummies, which incidentally is illegal to photograph, are not from Siberia, Alaska, or Asia, and did not arrive via the Bering Strait. Professor Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and Professor Bruce Bradley of the University of Exeter, the two leading archaeologists who have analyzed all the evidence, proposed that the Stone Age people from Western Europe migrated to North America at the height of the Ice Age by traveling over the icy surface or by boat along the edge of the frozen northern part of the Atlantic. They present their detailed evidence in a book called Across the Atlantic Ice, and here are some excerpts of what is covered. This is the Clovis projectile point right here. Uh, it is recognized because of its distinctive flute. Can, can you see this? Do, 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 do. That's a flute. Uh, those occur on both sides of the projectile point and it's flaked on both sides. In other words, it's what archeologists call a biface artifact, a bifacial artifact. Most of the Paleolithic archeology span in the whole world is unifacial, in other words, large flakes and blades that are dressed up on one side only and minimally on the other side. Clovis was first found uh, in New Mexico with a uh, mammoth, as you see here in the slide, and uh, immediately uh, everybody considered Clovis to be big game specialists that hunted mammoths almost exclusively because for the next 20 years every Clovis site we found was associated with a mammoth. Uh, so that made pretty good sense and every Clovis site we found was at in a stratified deposit at least at the very bottom level. So it became quite clear to archaeologists that Clovis were the first people in the New World and about the same time, geologists working in uh, the Arctic had discovered that there was an ice-free corridor uh, and, and a, a bearing land bridge. And since we all know that Native Americans came from Asia and Clovis were the first Native Americans, they crossed from Asia, crossed the land bridge, waited for the gla great glaciers to melt apart, and then scampered down through the ice-free corridor and ate all of the... Um, megafauna on their way to South America. That's what you learn in the textbooks, right? Well, that's a good idea. Uh, and in graduate school, I decided it would be a good thing to spend part of my career on is working in the Arctic and finding the origins of Clovis. Well, some 30 years passed and we did not find the origins of Clovis. And uh, it, it got to be a little uh, disconcerting, but we always said if we could ever get into Siberia, there it would be. Right in front of us, of course. Well, finally, uh, with Glasnost and the opening up of uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, finally, a number of us got to uh, visit collections in Siberia, work with uh, Siberian archaeologists, and uh, Turns out there isn't much in Siberia that even looks like Clovis. This is a totally different technological adaptation to weaponry than Clovis. And it moves into northeastern Asia about 29,000 years ago and it maintained its primacy as technology until people moved into Alaska, crossing the Bering Land Bridge, 
but not moving much further south until after Clovis times, because as we know now from new geologic work, the ice-free corridor did not open up until after Clovis people were here. Whoa, bad news, huh? So along with these new realizations, uh, a number of uh, uh, really good databases began to be put together. The one that's on the screen right now is uh, in part based on uh, Anderson, Fott, and Gillum, who started the Clovis database uh, out of the University of Tennessee. And uh, they've done an excellent job for us and, and have enlisted state archaeologists to uh, provide uh, data on Clovis artifacts uh, for the database. And as that database began to take form, some things really started to stand out to me at least, and that is that the biggest concentration of Clovis people is in the east and southeast, uh, the Trans-Appalachia area. And if you look at the, these colors, the orange, yellow, and dark green, these are the major areas where lots and lots of Clovis projectile points artifacts have been found. And as you move westward, you get fewer and fewer. In fact, you can see we, uh, at the Smithsonian, we overlaid uh, the map that they put together on the distributions with the river systems. And we begin to see, even though it is a computer-generated uh, model, that it looks like they're moving to the headwaters uh, moving westward, uh, once hitting the headwaters, then the next group, next wave, is moving further west till they hit the headwaters of the second degree uh, drainages. And then finally, a few folks getting out through the northern plains, southern plains, and some folks getting up into northern Mexico, uh, and a pretty good com uh, uh, number of them here. But most of this area out here in the far west was not inhabited by Clovis people at least. Then the next thing that begins to take shape here as you look at this map is the radiocarbon dates. And just recently a paper's been published by uh, uh, Waters and Stafford that points out that most of the radiocarbon dates for Clovis are around 10,900 years of age. And that's a pretty interesting time because right at 10,900 years ago, there was an abrupt climatic change from a warm period that, that developed after the end of the last glacial maximum or, uh, that's called the Younger Dryas. And the Younger Dryas overnight, practically, turned all of the Northern Hemisphere cold. And that was at 10,900. And we started looking at all these dates and said, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting correlation there. What does it mean? But in their database, they left out a couple that I kind of and, and a little bit partial to, and they're older than the rest. And uh, when asked about that, they said, well, you know, we weren't sure they're Clovis, so we dropped them. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, they didn't fit your model, did they? I'll get back to these sites a little later. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the concentration, density of sites and artifacts, Clovis artifacts in eastern North America. I want you to look at the red dots on the eastern shore of the Delmarva Peninsula here, this area here. Uh, there are more, and these are actual Clovis sites, and to be counted, even though they're all, 100% all surface sites, uh, they all have to have, in order to get elected as a Clovis site, uh, at least three diagnostic artifacts. Otherwise, they're what we call an, an I.O. or a, an independent find. Um, there are more Clovis sites. This is, uh, can you see the scale here? That's 20 kilometers, I think. I can't read it here. But uh, Look at, there's how many Clovis sites do you see here? There are more Clovis sites on this little chunk of Delaware, Virginia, and Maryland than there are in the entire Rocky Mountains westward. Now the final straw that, that broke my back at least was the discovery in Virginia of a site called Cactus Hill, which is southeast uh, of uh, Richmond 
on the Nottoway River, for those of you who uh, know Virginia. And at this site was stratified, starting off the colonial time period and moving back through like pages of books, uh, down to Paleo-Indian time periods, and then a nice Clovis level with classic Clovis stuff. And then a few centimeters below that, they found the unspeakable, another occupation level that apparently wasn't Clovis. And boy, did that cause a big stir amongst the Clovis first people. In fact, it's so easy to look at these. And yeah, there, there's a relationship here in terms of bifacial technology. Uh, we have a blade technology, which Clovis also has a well-developed blade technology. But the difference between these projectile points is that these uh, in the lower level were not fluted, like the Clovis with their nice flutes from the base. These are not fluted. And the radiocarbon date came back, and guess what it was? 16,900 years old. Now that really upset the Clovis first people, because that's about 5,000 years older than Clovis. Oh, too bad. <laughs> uh, these projectile points and the blade technology look remarkably like Salutrian. And Bruce, this is Bruce here, this is my wife Peggy, that's me. Bruce had talked about a, a, a technique called overshot flaking, which was used uh, as a purposeful technique by the Salutrian people and as a purposeful technique by Clovis people. So when I saw the uh, Cactus Hill artifacts, I said, Bruce, you know, there may be something to this Salutrian Clovis connection. Uh, let's take a look. You know, I've been talked about a uh, number of professional archaeologists that say, oh, that stuff sure looks like Salutrian, or that Salutrian stuff sure looks like Clovis, but nobody was serious because, you know, you had the Atlantic Ocean out there. Uh, and there was five, 6,000 years of difference in time. So that's eh, independent invention, convergence, whatever you want to say. And it was totally ignored. Well, in the meantime, we figured out that, you know, over in the Pacific, 40,000 plus years, folks were sailing around boats. Now boats are a pretty good idea, aren't they? They kind of change your perspective of the world because oceans, lakes, rivers, waterways in general, no longer are barriers, but they are highways. So let's go to France, let's go to northern Spain and look at those Salutrian artifacts and see how they really do, might, how they really might relate to Clovis. So it was a hard job, somebody had to do it, and we did. <laughs> now, what we found even surprised us. Uh, this is a, a typical Clovis point. Here is a not particularly typical Salutrian point, but a type of Salutrian point that only occurs in the Franco Cantabrian area of the uh, Salutrian occupation. And we found in at least two sites potentially fluted points. Now well, that's kind of cool. 219195, that's cool. Then we found that the core and blade technology revolving around three types of cores, wedge-shaped cores, uh, conical cores, and uh, smaller uh, uh, circular cores occurred and manufacturing techniques were the same. That's getting a little exciting. In fact, by the time we put our database together, we found that there were 32 almost perfectly good comparisons or, or fits between Clovis and Salutrian. In Siberia and all the work that my colleagues and myself have done in the Beringia, Siberia, Eastern Asia, if you find one of these technologies at any one time period, you've done a major find because they just do not exist. Uh, the, every now and then you see something. You can make up a list that you can match these in Siberia and when you look at the radiocarbon dates of the sites that you had to cherry pick to get these technologies out of, you span 18,000 years of time. 
Subtract 18,000 from 2008. That puts you back into Salutrian time. Uh, we're also seeing some non-technological issues, such as raw material sources. Both Clovis and Salutrian people went out of their way to find the prettiest, most workable stone they could, and when possible, they flaked quartz crystal. These are uh, uh, examples of Clovis artifacts made out of quartz crystal uh, from North Carolina to Idaho. And if there's quartz crystal, you know they're doing it. Uh, Salutri guys did the same thing. The osseous antler ivory bone tool assemblage from Clovis and Salutrian are just practically one-to-one -one with atlatl hooks, uh, what the French call sagays, uh, which are bone projectile points. In fact, the patterning on this one from Florida is almost identical to one from uh, uh, France, uh, but that's got to be a, a, a total accident. But nonetheless, uh, shaft uh, wrenches, uh, there's a shaft wrench that's identical to this from France. And, and numerous bone tools, including, and this is important, eyed needles. Uh, Salutrian and, and uh, Clovis and a modern needle here. Uh, the eyed needle is probably the most important artifact we've looked at yet today because we have to remember that the Salutrian people, according to uh, the geneticists moved into uh, France and Spain around 22,000 years ago, or at the height of the last glaciation. So these people were living in polar and subpolar conditions. They needed waterproof clothing. They needed good all-weather clothing. They needed excellent shelters, all kinds of artifacts they needed in order to survive the Ice Age of Europe. And uh, the eyed needle is, is right up there at the top of the list. And it was uh, carried to the Americas. Art. The Salutrian people are known for their artwork. Clovis people aren't. Uh, but Clovis people are staying out of caves. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I could give you some thoughts on that. But nonetheless, they both have portable art. And uh, portable art consists of everything from scratches, designs, to anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figures. And I kind of like this particular group because these are all showing arrows or spears stuck into hapless critters all the way from uh, Italy, across Spain, and out to Galt, Texas. And uh, using the same motif, but then again, if you're going to draw a spear with feathers on it, that's probably what you'd come up with. So we put our database, and it's been simplified here, uh, into a cluster diagram. And we find that pre-Clovis, now we haven't talked about pre-Clovis yet. Pre-Clovis consists of uh, Cactus Hill and um, <clears throat> the Meadowcroft site, which is a site in Pennsylvania that has an early date uh, that's been highly controversial. And about three more sites that I will name in a minute. Uh, the clue, our, our fluted point data, Clovis, and these cluster together, which is the pre-Clovis, Clovis, Clovis uh, late French Salutrian, middle French Salutrian, northern Spanish Salutrian. Then our Arctic materials from Siberia and Alaska, Ninana, Mesa Sluice uh, Denali, and Ushki, uh, and Duktai, all cluster together, and then the classic uh, French European uh, Paleolithic people all clustered together. And I think that's uh, telling us some interesting things. So at that point, Bruce and I said, well, maybe we have a hypothesis here that uh, deserves some testing and we should push it a little further and see exactly how this might have worked. Because uh, it's beginning to be pretty clear to us that there has to be a historic relationship on the account of not only the technological, but uh, other non-technological uh, cultural traits that they have in common. So here's a picture of Europe in the last ice age. And these are Salutrian sites. These are, this is the continental shelf here. Uh, and uh, a little bit of England showing up, a little bit of Ireland. Uh, but notice that the North Sea English Channel, uh, the continental shelf out here, is all would have all been open territory 
for people to exploit. Unfortunately, all our models of the European Paleolithic are based on non-coastal sites, uh, which is too bad. Uh, but there is really no way to, uh, you just don't have the data from the stuff that's uh, a couple hundred feet underwater. But it is out there. Um, for instance, uh, this is a, a, a group of people that are uh, dredging up mammoth bones off the uh, coast of France. Uh, these mammoth jaw bones, lots of mammoths. This is one day's catch. Pretty good catch. Here's another group that's dredging up bones uh, off the coast of uh, Holland. And what makes an archaeologist's heart weep is this picture because that's a dumpster. And what they have done is gone through their dredge pile and sorted out the bones that won't sell to the nature stores and throw them into these dumper, dumpsters. And then the good bones that people say, oh, that's pretty, I'll buy that black bone. It's a mammoth bone from wherever. Uh, and they get shipped all over the world. And it's not against the law. And this, Spirally fractured, butchered bones are taken to the city dump. Probably two or three of these a month. So you know that our paleontological and archaeological record of the North Sea, at least around Holland, is uh, getting ruined. And it's odd to me that no artifacts turn up in these activities. I have to think about that for a while because we know that the British Historic Trust has been mapping the North Sea floor and they've come up with 150 Paleolithic sites and artifacts. So where are these artifacts going? So at any rate, to get back to our Salutrian people, here we are on the north coast of Spain. Here are the high picos during Salutrian times. This whole area back through here was glaciated. Permanent snow line was down here. And then we have cave sites such as Altamira here. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, uh, these are all high elevation sites. So when you look at the whole picture, here we go. This is La Riera Cave, which is excavated by uh, Strauss and Clark. Really probably one of the best excavated Salutrian sites there is, and it's well reported, and they did an excellent job of excavation. It sits right here, which is about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers from the present day sea coast. But if you drop the sea level down from here, see where that buffalo is pointing his head, that little bench? That's today's sea level. You drop down off that limestone bench, and I'll bet you there's a bunch of caves and rock shoulders right there that won't quit. And you come out here another 10 to 20 kilometers, and you hit the beach. So then when we place these on, uh, radiocarbon dates on an array, starting uh, in Cantabria with the Spanish sites, all the way down to Montana, we have an overlap of two sigma. So we now have closed the time gap, the technology gap, and all we need to do is find a really old site. Well, this is the latest in our archaeological field inventory of equipment. <laughs> See? There's a small, um, museum on Gwen Island, uh, just off of the Virginia Capes. And uh, they had asked uh, Darren to come down and identify some artifacts that they had been, uh, that had been donated to him, just standard arrowheads. And so he, he's an obliging young man, so he went down and he was telling them what everything was. And he looks over and he sees a case, and he sees mastodon bones in that case. And he, oh, wow. So he went over and he looked and, holy smokes. There was something in there that really caught his eye. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. So he called me. And uh, I think I'll show it to you right now. How do you like that, guys? Does this look like the one I told you to remember? 
That's a Salutrian laurel leaf, bigger than heck. But now, why did Darren get excited about it? Well, because it was with mastodon bones, for one, and two, it was found in 1970 by a group of fishermen who were out 40 miles off the Virginia Capes, deep, deep sea scallop fishing. And they were sucking up all this stuff and then you sort it all out when it gets into the bale. And all of a sudden, it, poof, out comes mastodon teeth, chunks of ivory, pieces of bone. And the fishermen got all excited and they were getting the ivory and the teeth and they thought they had a real find there. And then poof, up comes that laurel leaf. Eh, just an old arrowhead. Um, So they gave it to the museum at Gwen Island, along with some of the ivory and a, and a tooth. So if we look at their find, this is uh, Captain Sean's biface, was found right here. Here's Miles Point. This is the Susquehanna River, found right at the mouth. Look at this, these are mastodon finds. This is the Hudson, Hudson Channel. Look at that, was the Hudson Channel during the LGM was a wonderful mastodon locality. And then we're getting mammoths over here. So it's clear to me that we really have to start exploring the continental shelf and we will uh, find a lot of good stuff out there. For instance, this is Assateague area, uh, Barrier Islands. We're coming down the Susquehanna River. At Clovis times, this was the beginning of the, uh, uh, the bay. And here are the barrier islands for the Clovis people. Uh, the Chesapeake hadn't started to develop uh, as well during the uh, uh, LGM. And here are the barrier islands for the LGM. If you were a, a um, Cactus Hill hunter and you were out there, you'd be hunting right behind these. And right there is where Captain Sean found the mastodon and the laurel leaf bipoint. That artifact has to be 18,000 plus years old. We should have a radiocarbon date any day because Tom Stafford said the ivory we sent him had the best collagen preservation of any ivory he ever tried to date. And I was hoping he would call me last night and tell me the date. But I can assure you that that is probably the oldest formal tool yet found in the Americas. Thank you for listening. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an author, producer, and independent anthropologist. My books are available on Amazon.com. Please read them if you enjoy watching my video presentations. I'd like to thank my subscribers who have donated recently to Atlantean Gardens. That's the nonprofit organization that sponsors my research. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. Your comments are always welcome. Feedback is encouraged. And don't forget to share. Thanks. See you next time. <laughs>